Okay, thank you for joining um, today's webinar on the eve of the introduction of HMRC's mandatory additional information form. Um, I hope you've got all your pre-AIF submissions in. Um, if you haven't, I'll totally accept if you sort of dial off and we'll send you the recording afterwards. Um, I appreciate today's quite a sort of key day for everybody in the world of R&D. Um, so my name's Carrie Rutland. I'm a partner in the Innovation Incentives team at BDO, and I'm joined by Katie Rubindran, a director in our team. And can we move on to the next slide, please? So this is me and Katie. Next slide. So today, Katie and I are going to be taking you through a quick overview of the R&D reforms that are currently underway. Then we'll do a deep dive into the additional information form, which is mandatory for all R&D claims submitted tomorrow and going forward. Um, then we'll look at the sort of some of the reasons why that form has been introduced, um, and in particular, HMRC's focus on error and fraud. Um, we'll have a quick overview of the single R&D scheme that has been proposed by HMRC. Um, and then we'll finally wrap up about how to make sure your claims are robust and avoid an R&D inquiry. So without further ado, I'll just take you through a quick overview of the R&D reforms. Um, and as I said, we'll be sending these slides out afterwards, so I'm not going to go into everything in detail here. The key things that I wanted to bring out is the number of reforms that are currently on, undergoing, and actually the difference in accounting period starting dates. So they all come in at different times, um, for different companies um, and, and have different implications on your R&D claims. So it's really worth being on top of what comes in when um, and making sure you're preparing and you're transitioning to those changes. Um, a whole suite of changes um, designed to root out the error, abuse, fraud and, um, in the R&D regime at the moment. And probably the most significant um, change that's coming in is the additional information form. Um, which comes in tomorrow. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass over to Katie, who will go do a deep dive into that AIF. Thanks, Carrie. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, what is the additional information form and how does it fit into our current way of doing R&D claims? So anyone who is submitting an R&D claim today will probably be submitting a number within their corporation tax computation because you need to have actually made the claim and likely a, a accompanying form of narrative. So HMRC have previously recommended supporting your claim with technical descriptions of the projects undertaken. And what's evolved in practice is an R&D tax relief report, which does both this and it discloses a methodology to HMRC. So what's, how's that going to look from tomorrow? So tomorrow, there's going to be a new way to submit R&D tax relief claims. So you still need to put a number in your tax computations and in your return, which go to HMRC. That hasn't changed. But before you can make that claim for R&D, you need to have submitted an additional information form online. And the neat iPad box here gives you a snapshot of how that looks. There's various headings and bits that you need to fill in in a form accessed through um, HMRC's portal. The additional information form will apply for all periods that you're claiming for. So each year is going to need its own additional information form and it must be submitted online. Failure to supply an additional information form invalidates your submission for R&D tax relief purposes. Now that might seem very obvious today in the light of lots of time, but if we're running close to a deadline, making sure the AIF is submitted and then the tax computation submitted will be very important because there is no discretion for an HMRC inspector to change this system. OK, so what do you need? A separate R&D narrative will be needed for each R&D project that you disclose, even if you've got an R&D project for a second year of claiming. So at the moment, there might be people who submit an R&D report covers two years or even people who submit an R&D report that covers more than one company in a group situation. And this is going to narrow down what you can submit and when you can submit it. Now, I think it is worth also saying there's a bit of a divergence from HMRC. 
If you're a large business, now for HMRC, those are the largest taxpaying companies and they have a corporate and compliance manager. Those businesses will need to submit an additional, an additional, uh, an additional information form with each of their claims, but alongside that can continue to submit their R&D tax relief report, which will be reviewed and considered by their corporate compliance manager or CCM. Businesses not covered by large business won't have that same um, privilege. So we will expect it to submit an additional information form, but any specific R&D report that is accompanying that is unlikely to be considered by HMRC when reviewing the R&D claims. So it will be important to think about what's disclosed in your tax computations and your tax return alongside the additional information form. So what additional information does this need to cover? So there's three categories. The sum is on this slide, then we've got two following slides to talk about that. So additional information forms, um, the first category would be what I'd call additional information and background to the company and claim. So things I've specifically drawn out on this slide are the endorsed name senior person within the company who signs off the R&D claim, full contact details of the R&D agent who's advised you on compiling the claim and specific project and cost details. But in addition, you need um, smaller information like the company's PAYE reference number, VAT number, etc. So there's a whole host of small pieces of information that need to form part of the, of the claim. And BDO captures that in our process, we use a specific tool called BDO Capture, which means you fill in one submission of information which can go straight to your additional information form. And I'm sure others will find ways to make sure that data transposes um, without error or problem. Next slide, please. So I said there were three categories of information needed as part of additional information. First, the company background. Second is project data. Now, you've always needed to include some information about your project. As I said, it's been recommended for a number of years you submit technical narratives alongside your R&D tax relief claims. But what we're being given now is a far more prescriptive format in which to do that, which in many ways is helpful because it explains to a company exactly what should be um, provided. Um, and these are the typical questions that, that are included and that you need to answer as part of putting together your R&D claim. This is an area that's always very important with R&D claims, and it's an area where we see the most in terms of HMRC inquiries about what activities genuinely count as R&D. And HMRC have shared with us some guidelines because we are aware some businesses use similar technical narratives from one year to the next. And that might just be projects have a very long shelf life, or it might be that the R&D undertaken in one year failed and so a project's continued into the next year. But because the AIF will need to be submitted each year, being very clear on what is the starting point for the R&D project for this year is going to be particularly important, as well as how you overcome those uncertainties. How did you do that? Presumably last year it would have been different to what you were looking for this year. So making sure that data is continually refreshed is going to be even more important now. Um, in particular, HMRC guidance says you can't say, I refer you to last year's AIF form. So each form is going to have to stand on its own and meet all of these requirements. One final thing I wanted to add in here, which is something we see a lot with HMRC inquiry, is there then to ask about who is the competent professional within your business? So the competent professional for R&D tax relief purposes is the person who effectively looks at what are the R&D activities within the business and compares it with the baseline to determine what qualifies for R&D. And we as advisors help and support them in that assessment. HMRC often ask who is the competent professional, what background did they have and how are they judged as irrelevant to make that decision? And there no, seems no part in this form in being able to do that. So do make sure you weave that in if you're submitting this on your own. Next slide, please. And I talked about costing data. So this is the third category covered by the form. And if you already do an R&D tax relief report in support of your R&D claims, hopefully all of this is relatively familiar to you. Certainly the cost category should be familiar to anybody who makes an R&D tax relief claim. 
And again, the little iPad on the side just shows you what this looks like in terms of the HMRC form. We have to tick which categories you have. What's different going forward is that you're going to have to look at these project costs by project. So you're going to need to separately identify each of these categories. And then for each project, explain what of what of that qualifying expenditure relates to specific projects. The reason that they need that is HMRC are now being prescriptive about how many technical narratives you include. So if you have one to three projects that your claim covers, you're going to need to write up all three of those projects. But if you have more than three projects, you're going to have to write up a number of technical narratives that completes over 50% of your qualifying expenditure within the claim. So it needs a way to track and make sure you've done that. And the way to do that is say technical narrative number one, what were my associated costs and add that up until you were at over 50%. The good news is if you've got hundreds and hundreds of projects and that would take you a long time to get to, the max is going to be 10. So those businesses with hundreds of projects are going to find um, there's at least a cap. Next slide, please. So the impact of the additional information form for me really fits in two key areas, risk. This is going to give HMRC more information with which to raise inquiries. In some ways, this is helpful because those inquiries should at least be more targeted based on the additional information you've um, provided to them. It could expose shortcomings in previous claims. So we'll talk in a little bit more detail going um, on another slide about what you can do about that. Particularly if, say, a project you've claimed as a high amount of qualifying expenditure in a previous year were to dock down, it could, it could highlight that more than perhaps is done at the moment. And I think for reasons both of the additional information form and that you'll later hear from Carrie, we are expecting to see an increase in numbers of HMRC inquiry, making what you do submit to HMRC even more important. So in terms of costs, um, there is going to be more information needed and therefore there will be additional time costs for you, potentially costs from advisors in terms of putting this data together. And multiple claims are going to need more data for the overall claim basis. So I talked about in a group situation, maybe a group report has been filed with a set number of technical narratives. Now that you're looking limited company by limited company, that could mean that there's um, more to do. And I think, sadly, there are winners and losers through this new process. So those businesses who already project account are going to have a higher starting point in terms of putting the additional information together than those who don't and need to have a methodology to do that. And again, those who already submit lots of technical narratives in support of their claim are going to have less change to process and potential change to cost than others. Next slide, please. So bearing all that in mind, what does that mean for you sitting here today um, and your claim that hopefully you got filed today and now you have a new claim going forwards? So firstly, have you got the right processes, advisors and records in place for the current year of R&D claim that you're making? So one of some of the things to reflect on are, I talked about the importance of the number of projects you've covered by technical narrative. Well, your system and company's way of allocating time to projects may be totally different to another's. So reflecting on, have we got the right projects is going to be very important in determining the level of disclosure that you have. So thinking about that might be one aspect of process or records that could be important. And another area, just to give you an example, would be project costs. I've talked about some businesses will already have project accounting, great. Others will now need to start to apportion costs between projects. So you'll be asking the business or or um, the technical people in your team to assess how much time have they sent on a project and also how of that, how much of that time was R&D. Now, just as an example, I know human nature can be when applying two percentages instead of one to end up at a lower number. So it's maybe using your starting point as like allocating R&D percentages as they have in prior years and then allocating across projects. So it's not just about having the processes in place that meet the additional information form. It's about giving some thought to what those processes look like to correctly identify and capture the R&D costs. 
then all of BDO's processes have already been updated so that anyone, any one of you who sits here today as a BDO client can have confidence that we're putting them together in the new way. Then we looked at prior year claims. Do your new processes that you're putting on place or anything that you've, you've done in respect of your future claims lead you to reflect that maybe your prior year claims need adjustments? And that could just be that when people start allocating time across the different projects, they realize that an ineligible project, for instance, actually contained far more time than they had thought or, or vice versa. And then going forwards, what does this mean for your claims? Are there things you need to change? And we'll touch in future slides about the accounting records, but how do you capture and manage who's signing off your R&D claims? Who, who are the competent professionals in the business so that everything can be tracked along the way? So I suggest those are three areas that for me would come out of the AIF if you're spitting at the moment. I'm going to hand over to Carrie because the next slide really does follow on from that in terms of um, the context as to why the AIF was introduced in the first place. Carrie. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for the people who've started putting questions in the Q&A function. Um, so we've had a look at them and we'll be having a dedicated um, time at the end of this webinar just to go through those Q&A. So keep, keep them going, please. Um, so Katie has been through the additional information form um, and my session now is really to look at what's driving it. Um, and you would have seen about two weeks ago the HMRC published its new estimates of the amount of fraud and error um, in the R&D regime. Um, and it's an eye-watering 1.13 billion. Um, so that's roughly 2% of all R&D um, claims made. Um, and it's over twice what their previous estimates were. Um, so rightly so, HMRC um, and the, the government and the treasury are concerned about that level of error and sort of rooting it out, identifying where it is and, and making sure that R&D claims going forward are compliant. So they've been doing some analysis as to where the problem is. Um, and as you can see, the problem seems to be in the SME um, claims. So roughly a quarter of SME claims have some problem associated with them. So they're either fraudulent or they contain a mistake. Um, and you compare that with um, claims might need under the RDEC or the large company regime, and it's only 4%. Um, so SME claims seem to be sort of more wrong than RDEC claims. Um, and is it fraud or is it error? Um, well, it predominantly seems to be due to errors. Um, the amount of fraud less than 5%. Um, so yes, HMRC are sort of keeping their eyes open to the fraud, but it's more about actually let's correct those errors in R&D claims. Next slide, please. So we understand that HMRC statistics are telling us it's SME claims that have the problem. Um, this further analysis is looking at which sectors um, are the R&D mistakes made in. Um, and it's quite interesting to me um, because actually manufacturing is the only sector where the majority of the R&D claims are compliant. Every other sector, the majority, so over 50% of the R&D claims submitted are wrong in some respect. Um, I can't say I'm wholly surprised by education um, being sort of very non-compliant um, because if you just go back to the definition of R&D being an advance in science or technology, you wouldn't expect there to be much R&D in education. Um, so maybe that's an area that actually there have been a lot of speculative claims. Um, but when you think about HMRC focusing on the areas where they think there's non-compliance, um, we've, we've clearly got FS FinTech, construction, IT, or the majority of the claims contain some mistakes. Um, so really quite an interesting um, yeah, overview. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the um, percentage of non-compliance by value of claims. So how big is the R&D claim? What's the benefit? And what's the proportion of it that's non-compliant, contains fraud or error? Um, and so you can see that the vast majority of the um, mistakes, the errors, are coming in small value claims. Um, and if you were to ask an HMRC inspector as to why that is, um, their starting point was would be that if you're not spending a meaningful amount of money, how can you be advancing science or technology um, as a whole? 
Um, so if you put the three statistics together, if you're an SME, your claim is under 30K in terms of benefit, um, and say you're in the education sector, I could almost guarantee that you're probably going to get an RD inquiry. Um, and so just use those statistics and actually think, is your claim at risk of an HMRC inquiry? And we'll pick up later some of the sort of tips and techniques for mitigating that inquiry. Um, next slide, please. So what's HMRC doing about the amount of error and fraud that it's identified? Um, so the first thing it's doing is education. It wants companies to um, get their R&D claims right. R&D tax credits are here to stay and the government is committed to them. So helping companies, giving them that education um, and helping work through any questions they've got. Um, raising agent standards. Um, you will have seen at the House of Lords subcommittee that there was quite a lot of sort of discussion about agents and how, how sort of professional they were being. So HMRC is cracking down on the less professional agents. Um, they've got 300 new R&D inspectors um, and they are targeting their inquiries um, in the areas where they believe the non-compliance is at, at the greatest level. Um, so that's a little bit about how HMRC is tackling that fraud and abuse. Next slide, please. But going forward, um, given that they believe that the problems are with the SME regime, um, what HMRC is proposing, or, or the Treasury, is that um, the R&D regime for SMEs will go um, and that there will be a new RDEX for all. So the R&D expenditure credit that uh, large companies are currently claiming on, all companies will claim um, under this new regime. Um, and you'll see at the bottom, the proposed start date is 1st of April 2024. So that's Q1 next year. Um, and just want to take a little bit of a, a pause at this moment, because if you think 1st of April 24, it's expenditure incurred after that date. So that means for all companies for next year, your December year end, there's going to be some change. You'll do your R&D claim three months one way and nine months of the year a different way. So if you just think about actually, Katie's been through about processes and planning, now's a really good time to start thinking, I'm gonna capture my R&D in real time. I've got two different processes for next year if the rules come in as planned. So if we go to the next slide. So this slide just talks about the differences between the um, large company, the RDEC regime um, and the SME regime. So this is your baseline. And this is what, what you're taking and what you're moving to a new regime from. Um, and just some of the ones that um, I wanted to highlight. So uh, our, our deck, so this is the large company regime, it's an above the line tax credit. Uh, Subcontractor costs don't qualify. So if I ask Katie to do a bit of r and on my project, I can't claim for Katie's costs. Um, there's a cap on the repayable tax credit if you're loss making and a complicated seven steps. Um, if you're an SME, the benefit goes through the tax line. Um, the rate of relief is up to 21%. You can claim for subcontractor costs. And there's a different way of calculating the PAY and NIC cap based on um, the entire PAY and NIC of the company that's making the claim. So there are some key differences between those two regimes. Next slide, please. So the new scheme, and this is expenditure on and after 1st of April 24. It's an above the line tax credit at 20%. Um, but um, if you're the principal, uh, you can claim for subcontracted costs. So that's a, a great thing if you're RDEC, if you're a large company. Um, but there's a bit of a wrinkle in this one um, because HMRC is currently sort of scrutinizing what they believe is a subsidy. Um, and there have been cases going through the court, um, principally the Quinn case. So HMRC's stance is that if you're doing a piece of R&D and it's got an end customer in mind, that end customer by 
by paying for the product at the end is subsidising your R&D. And the, merge, the new rules that for the merged R&D scheme say that if your R&D project is subsidised, you cannot claim for it. Um, what the courts are currently saying on subsidy is there's got to be a direct linkage between the customer's payment and the R&D. So just buying the product doesn't suffice. Um, but we really need this to be ironed out and sorted before 1st of April next year so that companies know what they can claim for. Um, and again, any grant funded projects are subsidised projects. So under the new rules, you wouldn't be able to claim for them at all. So some real issues that need to be ironed out. Um, other thing to just to point out is the PAYE NICAP is based on the SME regime, so it's more generous. Um, and the special loss-making R&D intensive regime um, is going to run in parallel uh, with this new merged R&D regime. So again, a lot to get head, your head round before the 1st of April next year. So certainly what BDO is proposing is actually encouraging HMRC to, and HMT to delay this. Uh, we've got an awful lot of change going on at the moment already. Um, so things like um, pure math, we've got the additional information form. Um, let's just slow down a little bit, um, give everybody time to work out what the merge scheme would mean for them to plan and to build those processes in um, before head, going on headlong into this um, new regime. Next slide, please. So how can you start planning for the merge um, scheme? I think really important is um, to consider the impact. So look at your um, contracts with your customers. Think about actually, does that mean they're subsidizing my R&D? Is there a direct linkage between the customer payments and the R&D that's going on? Think about the subcontractor relationships. So under the new regime, you can claim for subcontracted costs, but if work is subcontracted to you by another UK entity, you wouldn't be able to claim. So work out your position. Are you principal or, or um, subcontractee? Um, and maybe do a little bit of modelling so that you can inform to the board or build into your cash flow projections what that um, what the new R&D regime is going to mean for you. Um, but given all of this sort of the fraud and error um, that we've seen, HMRC are going to be keen that people get this right. Um, and we know they're going to be inquiring about it. So getting your head around all the changes um, up front and planning for them is really, really important. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Katie now, who's going to talk a little bit about actually that planning, what you can do to mitigate an HMRC inquiry. OK, thanks, Carrie. So, so I set into three categories here effectively what you could do and I'll go into a little bit of detail in the, in the next slides on some more around each of these areas. So on the technical side, as I said, it's where we see most R&D inquiry activity. Make sure your technical descriptions are robust and tie back to the DSIP guidelines on R&D. We're seeing, because Carrie mentioned about the increase in HMRC inquiries, we're seeing more and more HMRC caseworkers who have less and less experience of dealing with R&D tax relief claims. So making it easy to tie into the guidelines on R&D improves your, your um, chances of someone seeing and understanding that you are within those guidelines. And making sure your competent professionals have the right qualifications. We know HMRC do LinkedIn searches of people who are named as part of R&D tax relief claims. So they'll see and know the qualifications that are involved. So make sure you do that double checking as well. Or we can in your support. Financial, making sure you have good records as a basis for your claims. Ensuring you know how your R&D criteria apply. And that doesn't mean you can't use apportionments. Most companies that I work with use some form of apportionment somewhere along the line to get the right amount of costs associated to their claim. And likely we'll see more of that by project, but understanding how have those apportionments been calculated and considering the wider methodology for them will become even more important. And lastly, the risk management piece. 
how should you disclose information to HMRC? So I talked about that divergence at the beginning, that those who are under a corporate compliance manager and are the largest businesses may continue to submit an R&D tax leave report. What does that mean for others? And I put SME here, but really it's everybody else who falls into that bracket of not dealt with by large business. We know those reports going forwards will not be used by HMRC. And I saw a question come up about what would we do with the R&D report? Will we submit that as well? HMRC are asking for the additional information form, which means that potentially you may use some of the disclosures within your corporation tax computations themselves in order to disclose the right level of information in support of your claims to HMRC. Um, but, and you may still see good value in the R&D report itself in terms of a, as an internal document to track and understand the methodology that's been used, because it's a really helpful um, piece of documentation. And I talked about record keeping. And the last thing here on risk management is a bit of a top tip. So when you hit the button on your additional information form, and you can save it as you go along, but when you submit it, it will disappear into the HMRC ether. So it is really, really important before you do push the button to submit that you save a copy. And that's built into our processes here. So for every R&D claim we submit, we'll be maintaining a copy of the additional information form, both so that our clients can see a copy of what's been submitted as part of our own record keeping, but also as part of our internal process. So if you are an in-house tax person and like you to do this yourself, um, that is my top tip. Um, next slide, please. Um, so how can you know if you're getting your R&D claim right? Um, one of the ways you could do this is that BDO have developed an artificial intelligence benchmarking toolkit. Um, HMRC release statistics every year which talk about the size and nature of R&D tax relief claims um, across different sectors and sizes. Um, we have input that into our own AI tool, which means with a few metrics from your claims, we can see how they compare to others. Now, this is really useful from a number of perspectives. Firstly, I talked about how do you understand the risk profile of your claim? Well, I think understanding those in the context of others of the same sector and size is really useful. And also knowing that HMRC have that lens of what claims are expected in different sectors. Can, so applying that and knowing that for your business can be important. And where I use it with my clients is if they're above the average for R&D, we look at, well, actually, does that sit right with the nature of business that they are? Are they more innovative than their competitors? And if they're below, asking the same question, because that's a lot about um, your own commercial or competitive strategy as to where and how much you would invest in R&D. So I think knowing that can be very important. Next slide, please. And another other ways in which um, it may be useful to take those um, technical financial risk management further, you could look back at your historic R&D claims. They might be prepared in house or they might be prepared by somebody else. But I think now is a good time to start to forensically look at that and see whether the right claims have been made, particularly if you know you may be subject to due diligence in the future if you're looking at a potential exit. Um, because it is part of what will come up that there will be a review of the R&D claims because they're often material amounts of cash, particularly when accumulated over a number of years. So now is actually a really good moment to think, have we got the right processes and did we apply everything correctly in respect to prior years? And doing that gives real financial, uh, reduces the financial risk to you because you'll know where are the skeletons in my closet, what, what things may we need to change and could produce real opportunities. We've literally just resubmitted an R&D tax leave claim and raised the amount claimed considerably because the business just hadn't considered fully what they were doing. And inquiry support, if the worst does happen, if you get an HMRC inquiry and you're not quite sure how to respond or what to do, we can help and support you in that, whether that's in forensically analyzing the claims, recasting and recalculating those, or providing the detail that's now requested of the additional information form, but perhaps wasn't required at the time. And often with inquiry, it means you might go into some more detail on those um, technical areas rather than um, higher level. And we can also negotiate resolution with HMRC. And when we typically do that, we don't just look at one year, but might look at the future years of claims for the company. So, um, so do bear that in mind. Next slide, please. 
And finally, I feel like I banged the drum for records today, but I am an accountant. So um, really monitoring how you put your claim together, understanding your process and making sure you have all the documentation to back it up. It's just it's really vital and really useful to you as a business because you don't want because somebody has left to put all that information to have gone with them. Uh, and one of the ways BDO does this is through our global portal. And you can see a nice little picture here. But this is our attempt to move things away from email into a central system that relevant people within your business can access different layers of access so that they can access their own tasks and pieces of work that they need to review. We use this to share document and it provides a clear audit trail who's provided documentation, what responses have we had and how can how has a claim been signed off to who, is, for example, is the competent professional at the time. So, it can really help with your claims and, and we can help you put and design systems in place to do this type of thing, to reduce your risk of dispute, increase the certainty of your claims. Next slide, please. So I can see we've got 14 questions on the Q&A. So after this is your last slide, but in summary, I know and understand that the tone of this presentation and some of the communications about R&D tax relief at the moment are quite negative. But the positive RRD tax relief is how valuable it is as a source of funding for supporting innovation. And we know that HMRC and HM Treasury want to continue to invest in innovation in the UK. So it's really important that, that all of you who are on this call making genuine claims continue to do so. I'm aware there's a lot of change to keep track of. Carrie mentioned it before, and I think it's great the slide they've chosen here with the man with the calendar, because actually there's a lot of dates that you need to be aware of because of the number of changes we've got coming in. The environment for R&D claims has shifted to one that is a more con uh, with more controversy in terms of both understanding what's claimable because that's changing, and also HMRC's approach, which does seem to be clamping down in respect of those four Denera pieces Carrie talked through in detail. So making sure you understand what that means for you, which hopefully we've gone through through this presentation and that you've got the right advisor in place to support you with the claim. So they will be named in your HMRC submission and model it out. There's lots of information available both through this presentation and more widely too about how all this change impact your claims. There might be just one or two things we've spoken about today that could have great impact for you. And I've seen that in some of the questions. So do model out what could that mean? Um, some of the changes we've talked through today um, on the proposed single um, scheme are not yet in legislation, but the additional information form is happening. Thank you. I think we open to questions, Carrie. Next slide. Yep. So we'll work through the, the questions, and Katie and I will sort of take them alternately um, for the time being. Um, but keep them, do keep them coming. Um, so the first question is about the tax software, um, and can it do basically can it do an AIF um, automatically? Um, so we know Alpha Tax are working on this, but at the moment, um, the only way to do it is HMRC's online portal. Um, in the future, it may be possible for AlphaTax or another tax software provider to have an interface there, but that doesn't it exist at the moment. So there is no other option but to use HMRC's portal. Um, and as Katie said, print before you submit or PDF before you submit, because otherwise it's gone. Um, so we've got a next question which is about if there'll be any exemptions regarding the submission of technical information where a business is bound by security reasons. So, for example, defence companies we know um, 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 are bound by the Official Secrets Act, perhaps can't disclose that information to HMRC. Now, I haven't seen something specifically, but those rules would still apply. So HMRC is still keen for businesses who are doing genuine innovation to, um, to claim. You're not going to be able to circumvent the additional information form. So I expect there'll be needs to be some additional disclosure in that additional information form to explain that a project is top secret or what can be disclosed. But uh, Carrie, have you seen anything specific to defence companies um, raised about the AIF itself? So there's nothing yeah, specific, but mm -hmm. I'm aware of a lot of companies that have said basically, um, we can provide you further information on discussion or this is protected by um, sort of the, um, yes, the confidentiality reasons. So um, I would put as much to give HMRC a flavour of what that type of project is, but obviously 
being very mindful of your sort of you don't want any security breaches. Um, so we've got multiple qualifying projects each year and HMRC sample these to verify the claim. Um, are we now um, required to provide detail on every project or can we continue with a sample approach? Um, so at the moment, um, the HMRC inspector doesn't have discretion, so it needs to be the largest project. Um, so if you're doing multiple projects, you would be writing up the 10 largest. I think this is possibly one area that might evolve with practice that there may well be, if you've got a CCM, some ability, and, and particularly if they choose, to have a bit, a bit of HMRC um, dictating which projects you write up. But for the time being, it's you write up the largest projects until you hit the 50% of qualifying spend or three projects. Um, so the next question is, and as an experienced R&D claimant, we don't always use an R&D agent, generally use an agent every few years. Is it necessary to use an agent? Um, no, it's definitely not necessary to use an agent. The people who can submit an additional information form are the company themselves, their corporation tax agent or the R&D agent. So those, those three people are able to make the AIF submission. If you do use an R&D agent, agent, they should be named on the submission form. Um, but you, if you are preparing your own claims in-house, then you are able to make the um, submission of the additional information form. So the next question is, is it possible to have more than one competent professional um, per legal entity, per AIF? Absolutely, yes, you can. So you could, for example, name each competent professional for each of your projects that you've described. Um, there's got to be one person within the company who's taking overall responsibility for the R&D claim, but you can have different competent professionals for different projects. Um, so the next question I'm going to refer to Carrie because this was your slide, but this says, I think the changes summary diagram showed overseas costs as excluded for costs incurred after 1 April 2024. Is this not for accounting periods commencing after 1 April 2024? So this is one where there's been a lot of sort of debate. Um, so when the proposal to remove overseas costs came out first, they said April 24. Um, and they didn't actually say whether it's accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 24 or expenditure. So I think most people interpreted it as um, accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 24. Um, the draft legislation for the merged R&D regime, if they decide to go ahead with it, is very clear. It's expenditure after that date. Um, so I guess we wait and see whether or not the merged legislation as drafted um, comes in. But that is very clear expenditure after 1st of April. Um, so the next question is, do you recommend that companies still submit a separate R&D report or could the AIF replace this? I think this question might have been asked earlier on, but just to reiterate, those dealt with by large business and a um, separate R&D report will be part of the submission. Uh, for those people who are not looked after by a CCM, we've been told HMRC won't place reliance on the R&D report if it is submitted. So um, we would um, we will be submitting additional information form and making additional disclosures within the tax computations. Having a separate R&D report, very useful in terms of your own documentation. So you can be very clear about what has been done in terms of putting that together. OK, so we're back in the land of defence and subsidies and subcontract. Um, and this is one that actually I feel quite strongly about. And I feel quite strongly that actually there needs to be potentially some sort of lobbying. Um, because if, say, the MOD has subcontracted a piece of work to a defence company, um, then it may not be possible um, for that defence company to claim R&D tax relief. So what I think in terms of the subsidy and the subcontract clause is that if an overseas company or a government body has subsidised or subcontracted um, the work to a, a UK legal entity, then you should be entitled to claim. Um, but that's not in the, the draft legislation. That is something that we're going to have to continue to work with. And I would encourage I mean, if you've got a voice into HMT or if you're writing a commentary on um, the new legislation to feed in, um, because um, 1042C um, definitely, in my view, needs to change. Um, so the next question is wider. Is there a word limit for each section in the additional information form? So there is. 
Um, I have not looked at it for a little while because I understand it's it's considerable. So I think I think it equates to more than a page of A4. I think it's more like a couple of pages of A4 for each section. So I would actually worry if you were hitting the limits in terms of number of words for each section because you've probably gone slightly over what needs disclosing. But I do know that the format for entering your text is not very helpful. So you, it's quite a small word box. So I would certainly recommend if you're writing your own additional information form to write it into a Word document and, try and, and copy and paste it across, just because otherwise you'll find it very hard to follow. There are various other anomalies, like you can't include diagrams, it will just be text for the moment. Um, which I know are, are vastly unhelpful, but hopefully the word count piece at least is uh, relatively straightforward. Yeah, so I think it's um, 20,000 characters or something mind boggling like that per section. Um, so do we have any idea why HMRC have neglected competent professionals from the AIF? Um, no is the simple answer. Um, what I think, for, I, I guess, a weakness of the AIF is that there's no white space. There's no um, a place for you to actually allow you to write something in to explain your methodology to put through the competent professional on each project was to include start and end dates of the R&D. So given we've got 20,000 characters um, for each box, if you want to include that additional information, if you think it's going to be helpful, I would weave it into one of their standard questions. OK, so the next question, I'm not quite sure it fits into the presentation, but I will give you my response and Carrie might add. Read the question of subsidies. Does this only apply to UK companies paying for R&D or does it also include overseas businesses? So I suspect... This is merged regime. Yeah, go on, go on then, Carrie. Do you want to take this one? So in the um, draft legislation of the merged um, regime, it says... If your work is subcontracted to you by an overseas body, overseas business, you can claim. Um, there is no such carve out for subsidies. So if, there, if the subsidy is from an overseas business, that would prohibit you from claiming on that project. Um, so this is another area where I think the legislation needs to change. In, this, in the way that we've got a overseas carve out for, for subcontract, I think we need an overseas carve out for if a project is subsidized by somebody overseas. Um, but at the moment, a subsidy from anywhere would prohibit an R&D claim. Uh, so the next question is, have you any guidance on how to quantify qualifying indirect activities if these haven't been calculated before? E.g. estimate the percentage and just to extrapolate the same percentage across each project in the portfolio. Um, so. Qualifying indirect activities, for those who don't know, you'll have direct activities which are correct are resolving technical uncertainties or scientific uncertainties. So those are sort of your engineers or your developers. And qualifying indirect activities sit around that. So those are one step away from an R&D project, but are in support of the R&D activities. And there are particular categories. We have seen in previous years, HMRC require quite a close link between a project and a qualifying indirect activity. So it doesn't necessarily surprise me this new um, requirement to um, uh, provide additional information. If you've already claimed for qualifying indirect activities, then you have one step, which is to calculate what proportion relates to which project. In some cases where that's fair and reasonable, that will be on an overall percentage allocation basis. So it might be calculated according to how many staff are used in each R&D project, or it might be allocated on the basis, say, total costs of an R&D project. It will depend on the type of qualifying indirect activity. If you've never calculated qualifying indirect activities before, you've got that first stage, which is really about understanding what activities support your R&D project and which categories you should be looking at in the first place. So I think it's a two phase approach. If you've, been, if you've never done them before, do step one, which is work out what your qualifying activities are. And if you have, then it's working about how you, those go alongside projects. And in some cases where you already have project accounting, that will be clearer anyway. OK, next question. Do we know how many um, R&D cases are currently at the tribunal stage um, and in particular in relation to subsidised expenditure? Um, so we don't know the exact number. I know there are a handful um, in relation to um, subsidised R&D, so in particular like the Quinn and Hattie cases, um, but we don't know an exact number. 
Um, there was a very interesting upper tribunal case um, that was publicised last week, which refers to the Quinn um, case. And as you know, upper tribunal is press, um, creates legal precedent. Um, it wasn't an R&D case, but they referred to the decision in the Quinn uh, case, whereby um, it isn't um, subsidised R&D in essence, that direct and clear linkage. Um, so that was very helpful. Um, but in terms of how many cases are currently um, at tribunal stage, we don't know. So the next question is, are large companies expected to still produce a report alongside the AIF and send it to their CCM? Or is the information on the AIF sufficient in its place? I thought it was a replacement to enable consistency, easier analytics on HMRC side, not an additional requirement on top of the normal reporting. So there is no requirement for those businesses with a CCM to produce an R&D tax relief report, just to be clear. But what we have seen is our divergence in HMRC approach with the large business unit saying they still will review and consider an, um, an R&D report if it is submitted in those cases. That to me provides some clear guidance for companies in that space about what your CCM would expect, but no, it's not a requirement. So if you were looking to do the minimum, you would submit the additional information form. Brilliant. Okay, how does the merge scheme impact RDAs? Um, it doesn't. There is no sort of correlation between RDAs and the merge scheme at all. That was, that was too fast, Carrie. Um, next question is, can you please expand on what happens for a claim that involves more than 10 projects that falls within the 50% threshold? How are the costs relating to the other projects to be reallocated? Thanks. So this is about how many technical narratives you need to write up. So I explained if you, write, if you have one to three narratives, you write three narratives. If you've got more than three narratives, you have to write up a number of projects until you get to over 50% of your qualifying expenditure of your claim. If you reach 10 before that happens, you've reached the maximum. So it, I'm imagining if this um, this um, questioner's claim, they've got more than 10 projects and the top 10 do not account for all of their 50% of their qualifying expenditure. In that case, you would need to write up those 10. And let's say they only covered 10% of the projects that you claim, that is still what would be your submission through the additional information form. Okay. I've got a long question next, Carrie. Yes, I feel desperately sorry for Julia who wrote the question. So basically it's an IT, uh, IT company who's made two successful r and claims has submitted one and HMRC has basically um, rejected it out of hand, um, even though it's a valid claim. Um, and it seems like there's been sort of a lot of correspondence on either direction and it's not, not going anywhere. Um, you're not the only person is my first comment. There's a lot of commentary about that. Um, HMRC asking for loads of information um, and perfectly valid claims um, being rejected out of hand. Um, I think it's possibly because some of the RMD inspectors aren't particularly familiar with RMD and are sort of almost learning on the job. But yeah, you're definitely not, not the only person. Um, if you've reached a situation where you there's no more information to provide and you're not just you're not getting anywhere with HMRC, what I would probably recommend is thinking about mediation or alternative dispute resolution. So engage. Um, a um, qualified mediator to actually have a sit down meeting with you and HMRC um, to thrash it out in one day um, and to get that resolution. Um, because otherwise you're just sort of, you know, it's never going to move forward. So um, mediation is open to anybody at um, any stage during an R&D inquiry. Um, and we found it's had some really successful results of just getting that agreement on, on where the R&D is and getting everybody on the same page. Um, so that's what I recommend. Um, a good time. I was just talking about that this morning. Someone else, Gary. Um, will there be any liability on the competent person? OK, I think there are two people, if you like, here. Firstly, there's the competent professional. So the competent professional within an organisation is the person who's assessing the R&D. And the reason I talk about sharing details about the competent professional is that's what HMRC are looking to see, that the claim has probably been analysed in terms of whether or not it qualifies for R&D. So in releasing their name on the additional information form in terms of the technical description, no, there's nothing um, specific that um, in terms of liability would come back to that competent professional. 
in turn, and then the separate the piece is the named individual, which is the person responsible for the R&D claim. Again, at this point, this is that is a disclosure. So there are no specific rules around um, a, a liability surrounding that disclosure. I think it is to create accountability within a company and to create um, um, a, to give HMRC a contact name. And we expect him in a lot of cases, it'll be the same person who signs off the corporation tax return in any case. Okay, next question is about the group situation. So um, how many project descriptions are required in the group situation? And I've got a client of mine um, and we, it's a group and we do the R&D claims for 13 legal entities and they do lots of small projects. So theoretically, we might be writing 130 project descriptions. So that's 10 per company. Um, there is no group sort of um, principles in it. It's based entirely on legal entity or claimant company. Um, so up to 10 submissions per legal entity or 50% of qualifying spend. Um, and in my Armageddon scenario, we potentially um, have got 130 um, project narratives to write. So good news for you, sorry. Um, we've got a question from Gar. Will using an R&D agent to submit the SME claim reduce the likelihood of an HMRC inquiry? Um, I should say, I, it's like, I don't know the answer to that is, it, is the honest truth because how HMRC to determine who and how to inquire will be um, their own internal processes. Carrie shared with you the statistics we do know that information is being disclosed for a reason. How they will use it, um, I can't tell you at this point, Agar, but um, I think it's important to consider that you've got the right support in terms of your R&D tax relief claim, whether you do use an advisor or you submit yourself. OK, and the last question from Guy, I'm not sure quite where, where, the, where the question is. So we're talking about sort of software development and apps and can an app be qualifying R&D? I think What's really important is when you're doing an R&D claim is establish the baseline technology. So what technology is in the public domain and exists um, at the point that you start your project and what the step changes that you're seeking to make. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that apps are out, but you'd need to be doing something novel and innovative, something that takes science and technology as a whole beyond where it currently is. Um, and that's the key um, sort of criteria, regardless of what discipline it is. Um, so just look at that, that baseline, look at what's in the public domain, look at what knowledge you have internally, what, and what that step change is that you're trying to achieve. So I'd just like to sort of recap and thank you everybody for joining. Um, I, I'm conscious it is a very busy time. Um, we found this really interesting, particularly the Q&A at the end. Um, and feel free to reach out to me or Katie or your normal BDO contact if you've got any questions.